The last time I was talking to you, we were discussing the issue of the United States becoming an imperial nation. Um, I had mentioned at the time that uh, Teddy Roosevelt thought that this was a really good thing, that uh, what this was ultimately going to do is it was going to keep the balance of power in Europe. In other words, it would keep the French and the British and the Germans and the Italians, keep all those imperial countries in check with one, some, one another, and we would essentially be like the policemen of the world, so to speak. As you're about to find out, that prediction turned out to be very, very untrue, very, very wrong. The reason that we know that, the reason that it ultimately didn't keep the peace in the world is because approximately 14 years after the United States becomes an imperial country, um, we see the biggest, second biggest bloodbath in human history, the emergence of World War I. Now, when it comes to an explanation as to why a war happened, it can be really, really easy. Like, for instance, World War II is a pretty easy war to determine why it happened. Uh, Hitler was um, uh, a madman that somebody had to stop, and clearly, by invading various other countries, he wanted a war. It's pretty easy to figure out World War II. World War I is far more difficult to explain when it comes to the causation, although I bet that you, most of you anyway, have at least been taught one thing, probably remember one thing. But um, before we go any further, I want you to ask yourself, would you go down to your local recruitment agency and enlist upon hearing news that some guy that you've never met that you probably don't have any connection to, and you probably couldn't find his home country on a map if somebody said, look, it's in the central part of Europe. Would you go down and enlist in the U.S. Army if you found out that Franz Ferdinand had been assassinated in Vienna? My guess is probably not. So the idea that the assassination of the Arch, um, uh, Duke of Austria-Hungary being assassinated, it kick-started World War I, while not altogether wrong, it's probably not the best explanation in terms of why World War I happened in the first place. If you are interested in understanding how and why the war broke out, there are really two primary reasons that I need you to be mindful of. Now when I say need, it's not a European history class, I'm never going to test you on this stuff, but it's probably important that you understand this for the big picture. Issue number one would be what's happening in Germany in the early part of the 20th century, late 19th, early part of the 20th century. Now, before it was the Germany that you and I know of today, what Germany essentially was was a collection of states, none of which were really united. And the other thing that Germany was was the doormat of Europe. Um, European countries, predominantly the French, they exploited Germany socially, politically, and especially economically. But one of the people that wanted to put an end to this was a guy by the name of Karl von Bismarck. And one of the best ways, then now, or any time in between, that you have to unite a country is to take them into war. And so von Bismarck chooses a common enemy, which would be the French, declares war on the French, and what comes to be known as the Franco-Prussian War essentially unites the German states into what you and I think of as modern-day Germany. Now, this unification of Germany poses a really big problem to France, which up until that point had been the preeminent power on continental Europe. It was the top economy and the top military. All of a sudden, you've got this new guy in town that is posing a direct threat to your preeminence. What France does after after the Franco-Prussian War, is it goes out and it finds a buddy. It teams up with the Russians. Now, if you think about a map of Europe, you've got Germany right there in Central Europe, and to its west is France, and to its east is Russia. And so the brilliance of this French allegiance with the Russians is that it's going to make Germany fight a two-front war if war was to ever break out in between those two countries. Now, if you're Germany, this is a really big problem because it's very difficult to fight a two-front war to, to be placed two places at the same time. 
The guy that's running Germany at this particular moment, that would be a guy named William I, right? And he goes to his right-hand military man, a guy by the name of Alfred von Schlieven. He tells Schlieven that he wants him to put together a military solution to this problem, being right in the middle of a sandwich, the, the French on the west and the Russians on the east. So upon reviewing the situation, what von Schlieven suggests is that William I should go to the Russians and pay them off, buy them off, go pay them to be your friends and to break their allegiance with the, with the French. William doesn't like this idea. He says, you know what, we're not going down that road. I want you to give me a military solution to this problem. Ultimately, the solution that Schlieven comes up with is something that comes to be known as the Schlieven Plan. Okay? Let me explain to you how this works. Again, don't get bogged down in the details. Just listen to the big picture. When Germany sees Russia beginning to mobilize its army, the second that it begins to see Russia beginning to move toward war, they are going to put their troops on trains and they're going to ship them directly to the west. They're going to fight the French, knock them out as quickly as humanly possible, and then do a U-turn and make their way back to the eastern front where they'll either fight the Russians or they'll be, get ready to make peace with the Russians, whatever the case may be. This is what's known as the Schlieven Plan, and ultimately what it'll amount to is a doomsday device. Germany created a device that would ultimately destroy the world, but the problem was it couldn't tell anybody about it. So the moment that Russia starts to mobilize its army, this device is going to be put into place. And even if it makes sense for William to say, look, you know, Russia, that's probably not a good idea to do that. It can't do that. It's going to have to declare war on France. Why is this important? Why is it relevant? What's it got to do with World War I? Well, the second thing that I need you to be mindful of when it comes to the outbreak of war is what's happening in the Balkans, the southern and eastern part of Europe. Now, then now, and every time in between, that, that's home to a lot of different people, a lot of groups of people, Muslims, Christians, Jews, um, Slavs, uh, people that are various ethnicities, various nationalities, all living together under one roof that is, at this particular moment, known as the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, okay? Now, one of the countries that is under the rule of the Austrians, that would be Serbia. Now, Serbia is what we call a Slavic nation, S-L-A-V-I-C, Slavic. The Slavs were an ethnicity in Europe, and the biggest Slavic country would be Russia, okay? Now, when France went out and got a friend in Russia, Germany followed suit and befriended the Austrians. They said, we're going to form an alliance with Austria to offset France's advantage here. To which the French went out and made another alliance with the British. And when the British came in on the side of the French and the Russians, Germany went out and made yet another friend in the Italians. At least initially, they were in an alliance with Austria and Italy. It'll change a little bit later in the war. So you can really see what's going on here, right? In a very short amount of time, all of Europe, which was armed to the teeth, by the way, all of Europe is in an alliance with other European countries. And something that happens in some remote location that's got nothing to do with anybody in France or Britain or Germany or Russia or whatever, it could be the spark that pulls everybody into the war without anybody really understanding exactly what's happening. Enter into our conversation a Serbian national by the name of Gavriel Princip. Don't write his name down, he's not all that important. But what Princip does in 1914 is assassinate a guy named Franz Ferdinand, who was the Austrian heir to the empire. Okay? Princip didn't appreciate. Serbia living under Austrian rule, and he assassinated Franz Ferdinand. Now, what Austria begins to do is really begin to tighten the screws on Serbia. Now, keep in mind, I said that Serbia is a Slavic nation, and what Russia has vowed to do is protect any of its little brother Slavic countries, Serbia being one of those little brother countries. 
And so when Austria really gets serious about what's going on in Serbia, it really captures the attention of the Russians, who say, you better stop doing this. You better stop picking on our little brothers. And what they begin to do as things become more and more heated, they begin to mobilize their military. Russia is beginning to put troops on trains and move them closer and closer to the Austrian border. Now, you should remember why that's important. The reason that it's important is the second that Russia begins to move around its army, to mobilize its army, Germans are supposed to declare war on France and move to the Western Front. You're going to see this Schlieben plan is getting ready to be kicked into place. The problem is Germany can't tell anybody about this. It can't tell Russia, look, you can't do what you're doing with Austria. You can't protect Serbia. They try in a very roundabout and vague manner, but it ultimately doesn't come to any kind of pass. And so ultimately what's going to happen here is Russia is going to get into it with Austria, which is going to pull Germany into the fight. Germany is going to declare war on France. Britain is going to return the favor, declare war on Germany. Italy is going to get involved. Austria is going to declare war on Britain. And in less than a week, for reasons that virtually no European at the time would be able to explain to you right now, all of Europe is going to be locked into this madness of a war that you call World War I. It's slightly more complicated than your high school history teacher explained it to you, I'm sure. But at any rate, you do have basically all of Europe at war with one another. Now, if you've taken me before, or you've kind of gotten a sense as to the way that I examine history, you'll note that I really don't get into military history. If that's what you were thinking of when you took the class, then I'm sorry, but I'm probably going to disappoint you. What I will say is by the time 1914 rolls around, we have developed really, really interesting ways of killing each other. Very effective and very efficient ways of killing each other. Uh, weapons like the machine gun, weapons like biological and chemical war, these are weapons that are going to completely change the way that wars are fought, and soldiers are going to pick up on this very, very quickly. For instance, one of the things that you're going to see happening is the emergence of trench warfare. People dig a trench, they crawl inside of it, the bullets are zipping over their heads. The problem is, it's really going to make it difficult to deliver that knockout punch, because every time the French order their troops up and across the field, the Germans mow them down with machine guns. And every time the Germans get up the gall to do the same thing, the French mow them down with machine guns. So when future observers would call this generation of Europeans the quote-unquote lost generation, they really weren't exaggerating, considering Europe, for the most part, lost a generation of men because the fighting was so intense. At any rate, what I'd like you to understand here is you've pretty much got a stalemate. Going into 1917, it, it's pretty much a draw. But if you forced someone to tell you who is winning, if you forced me, for example, who's winning this war in 1917, I would err on the side of the Germans. They are on French soil, and I would give them a very slight edge, okay? And I would also say the only thing that's really keeping France in this game, and to a lesser extent Britain in this game, is the fact that Germany does have to keep its eye on Russia to the east. Keep in mind, Germany was being forced to fight this two-front war, and the Russians, who are very ill-prepared for this war, they're the real difference maker at this point. Now, the thing about the Russians, they had absolutely no business in the war to begin with. Um, they weren't really an industrialized nation, and so that means that they couldn't outfit their people with things like uh, guns or ammunition or, for the most part, food. And so there were some instances where you had German soldiers, excuse me, Russian soldiers that were sent to the front lines with two rounds of ammunition to fire, and that's if they were lucky. Some of them didn't even have a gun. So you can only imagine the suffering of the Russian people. Now, in 1917, there are two things that happen that are probably pretty noteworthy. First of all, because of the suffering due to the war, what you see is a communist takeover of Russia. It's called the Bolshevik Revolution. The Communist Party took over uh, the Russian state, 
and they assassinated the Tsar, the king of Russia, and they implemented uh, communism in Russia. The second thing that they do is they bow out of the war. Right? Keep in mind, it was pretty much the war that brought the communists to power in the first place. And they say this is more or less just a matter of worker fighting other worker. And so we're out of here. And what that does is it really swings the momentum in favor of the Germans. If the French are going to win this thing, the British are going to win this thing, they're going to need another partner. Right? I think you can see where I'm going with this. Up until 1917, we were doing everything within our power to stay neutral. What we really wanted to do was sell the Europeans, and we really didn't care who. We wanted to sell them military equipment so that they would get rich on this, right? So that we could make some money. The problem is there are going to be events that are largely going to be outside of um, the United States' control, okay? Um, the president at the time is a guy by the name of Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson felt that the war was more or less um, the causation of uneven development in terms of the capitalist system. What he thought was it was colonization that had really wrecked the world's economy. And in order for the economy to really come back, you would have to put into place certain measures to make the market really fair, free, but also fair, okay? And so what Woodrow Wilson is essentially saying is World War I is occurring because Britain basically owned the world's economy and Germany wanted a slice of it. So what I'm getting at here is Woodrow Wilson is really trying to keep America out of this war, but also structure the world uh, diplomatic um, system in the aftermath of the war in a way that's much more likely to prevent wars like this from ever happening in the first place. Unfortunately, in 1917, there are events that are really going to be difficult for him to resist when it comes to America's entrance into the war. For example, the sinking of the Lusitania. Now, the Lusitania was a British cruise ship, and the reason that this is important is that the Germans had declared unrestricted submarine warfare basically anywhere in the vicinity of Northern Europe. What they're trying to do is strangle the British into submission. They understood that if Britain wasn't able to trade with its empire, nothing got into Britain, nothing got out of Britain, right, that the British would be pretty close to surrendering. So what the Germans say is if we see a British ship in this part of the ocean, we, we vow we will sink it. Everybody's fair game. No trading with the British. No trading whatsoever. Well, in addition to British um, civilians, the Lusitania was also carrying American civilians, American tourists. Now, when the Germans torpedoed the Lusitania, it was sitting far below the sea level that it should have been if it was only carrying civilians alone. In other words, in addition to American civilians, it was also carrying American munitions that were going straight to Great Britain. Bottom line, we got our hand caught in the cookie jar. We got caught red-handed, okay? The Germans did exactly what they said that they were trying to do, which was put Britain in a stranglehold to choke it into submission. Now, the sinking of the Lusitania doesn't get America involved in the war, but it comes extremely, extremely close. There are a lot of Americans that are screaming at Woodrow Wilson to go to Congress and get a declaration of war, to avenge the bloodshed due to the sinking of the Lusitania. But while it's not the sinking of the Lusitania that's going to draw us in, it would be the Zimmerman note. Now, for your notes, what the Zimmerman note was, was a, it was a communication from Germany to Mexico. You heard me right, Mexico. Why Mexico? Well, Mexico is right next door to the United States. And what Germany wants Mexico to do is to attack the United States. Now, why attack the United States? The very last thing that the Germans want is America to get involved in the war in World War, excuse me, in 1917. The Russians had just exited. This was really good news for the Germans because now they could focus exclusively on the West. If the Americans come in, that's going to reopen that entire dynamic of a two-front war. That's the last thing in the world that the Germans wanted. So the idea is pretty simple. Keep the United States' hands full in the Western Hemisphere and you won't have to fight them over there in Europe. Okay? Now, 
in return for attacking the United States, Mexico would get some assistance in the aftermath of the war. Germany would come over and help Mexico win back the war that they lost to the United States in the Mexican-American War. Now, fortunately for the U.S., Mexico never vows to act on this offer. They, they never act on it whatsoever. But what the Zimmerman note does is propel American public opinion um, to the point where Woodrow Wilson cannot avoid getting involved in the war. Wilson was basically forced into this war, and what he begins to do in the aftermath of being forced in is try to put a positive spin on it. And when I say try to put a positive spin, what he's calling this is a war to end all wars, a war to make the world safe for democracy. In other words, we didn't ask for this fight, the fight came to us. We not only need to finish this fight in order to make the world safe for our kind of life, our way of life in the aftermath of the war, this is going to be a war where we're going to need to go fight it. And in the aftermath of the war, we're going to need to restructure world relations and the economy in a way that's much more likely to prevent future wars from happening. In other words, he's got a very ideological approach to this war. Now, again, I don't do a whole lot of military history, but let me explain to you what's happening in 1917. In 1917, France, Britain, Germany, they're all running on fumes when it comes to their economy, especially Germany. Germany's running out of money like yesterday, okay? They're also exhausted, okay? They have been fighting this war for more than three years, and it was still dragging on at this point in 1918. And so when Woodrow Wilson came up with his 14 points, a peace without victory, just about every belligerent, every country that was at war said, you know what, we can handle that. Give us our 14 points. Okay. Now, for your notes, Wilson's 14 points. I don't need you to know all 14 of them. I really only want you to focus on three. Okay. Keep in mind, Wilson wants to do two things in the aftermath of the war. He wants to improve global relations to the point where uh, that we, we can nip these problems, like the assassination of a political leader in a place that most people have never heard of. We can nip those problems in the bud. And furthermore, he wants to set up a new world order that is more likely to prevent future wars like this from happening. Okay, So to that end, what Wilson said was, what we need is free trade. Any country that wants to do business with another country has the absolute right to do that. There's nobody, not the British, not the French, not the Americans, that can restrict Germany's ability to do business in China, for example. Okay, That's one of the 14 points that you probably should have in your notes. Another one of the 14 points, free travel, Okay, freedom of the seas. Keep in mind, one of the things that really got America closer to war was the sinking of the Lusitania. And so what Wilson is proposing is that no country, Germany or otherwise, has the right to tell any other country, look, you've got to stay out of this neck of the woods. You simply can't travel here, not during this time period. The third point is probably the most important point that I need you to know, and that would be decolonization. What Wilson is proposing is give the colonies back to the indigenous people. So, for instance, the United States, which is also a colonial country, would give the Philippines back to the Filipinos. Now, why is this important? Think about that Spanish-American War. Before 1898, when war broke out, we were not an imperial country. After we defeated the Spanish, we had a colonial empire. We took colonies in Asia. We took colonies in the Caribbean. We pretty much called the shots all throughout the Caribbean. And so what Woodrow Wilson sees as a problem is other Johnny-come-lately countries like Germany and Italy had gotten into World War I on the assumption that there would be colonial handouts, colonial spoils in the aftermath of the war. Once Germany, theoretically anyway, defeated Britain and France, they could claim their territories throughout the globe and they could get rich off of those colonies the same way that the British and the French had done for centuries. What Woodrow Wilson is proposing is just give those colonies back to the indigenous people. Sell them your products if you want to, if you're the cheapest and best uh, product in town, but at the same time, no country should be an imperial country. Decolonization, give the colonies back to their indigenous inhabitants, okay?
Now, for the most part, everybody says, you know, we can handle that. Let's go ahead. Let's sign on the dotted line. Now, Germany is so enthusiastic that it actually disarms itself before it comes to the bargaining table. That was going to be a really fatal mistake. Here's why. Keep in mind, Germany posed a direct threat, especially to France, but to some extent Britain too. And Georges Clemenceau, the premier of France, needs to find a way to neutralize Germany. Otherwise, it's going to have a problem, more or less, calling the shots in Europe for the next several years. So France doesn't necessarily want to produce a situation where war is less likely to break out. It wants to produce a very selfish situation where Germany is no longer a threat to it. So Clemenceau, and to a lesser extent David Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, says, you know what, Wilson, we're just not drinking this 14-point Kool-Aid here. We're not going to go with the 14 points, right? At the 11th hour, they adopted something else in its place called the Treaty of Versailles. Right. Now, for your notes, the Treaty of Versailles does two things. One, it ends World War I. Treaty of Versailles ends World War I. Now, the second thing that it does is infinitely more important. It blames Germany for starting the war. And the reason that it blames Germany, or the reason that Germany had to accept this decision, was because it didn't have any way to resist it. Keep in mind, it had already disarmed itself. Now, because Germany was blamed for the war, they had to pay for the war. Now, I'm not a huge facts and figures guy, statistics kind of guy, but think about the kind of damages, financial damages, that war is going to produce. And also keep in mind that you don't only have to pay for your own damages, you have to pay for the French and the British damages too. I'm not going to throw a bunch of facts and figures at you. I will say that Germany made the last successful payment, paying off World War I, in 2010. So that's a long, long time. You think about when the war ends, 1918, all the way to 2010. It basically takes Germany a century to pay this thing off, okay? Now, the last thing that I'd like you to be mindful of when it comes to the Treaty of Versailles is it produces something called an unsettled peace, okay? In other words, it does produce peace. It ends the war, and you do have approximately 20 years of peace in Europe. But it's not going to be a lasting peace. Keep in mind, the 14 points was designed to produce lasting peace, peace for a long, long time. The Treaty of Versailles broke Germany financially and also broke it militarily, okay? And I think it's only inevitable that at some point you're going to see a populist German politician rise from the ranks and vow to undo this wrong. And it, it, it was an injustice that was done to Germany. It didn't start the war any more so than France, Britain, Austria, Russia, or who have you had uh, started the war. So anyway, what I'd like you to understand about this unsettled peace is it basically laid the groundwork for World War II, okay? What it, for the most part, what it does is it sets up for World War II. Germany was never going to accept the legitimacy of the Treaty of Versailles. It was going to do everything within its power to go ahead and overturn it. And if that meant declaring war, invading various other countries, producing just an insane military machine, it was not above doing that. Okay, Okay. so we've finished our discussion on World War One. What I'd like to do in the next video segment is talk about how this is going to change life in the United States back at home.